Hi, my name is Dhruva Verhatki, and I'm going to be talking about uh, preconditioning for sparse linear regression, both on the algorithm front and lower bound. And this is joint work with John Conner, Fred Poehler, and Raghu Mehta. To start off, let me introduce the sparse linear regression model. So sparse linear regression is a fundamental problem in high dimensional statistics that's been uh, widely studied for the last two decades or so. And there's a few different setups. So we're going to be considering the Gaussian random design setup. What this means is that there's an n by n covariance matrix sigma, and there's some unknown k sparse vector w star in n dimensions, where we are thinking of k as much smaller than n. We're given m independent samples, xi, yi, where each xi is drawn from the normal distribution with covariance sigma, and each yi is the inner product of xi with w star plus some independent noise. And the goal is to approximately recover W star from as few samples as possible. For simplicity in this talk, we're going to only consider the noiseless case where we're aiming to exactly recover W star. And we're also going to consider that the covariance matrix sigma, sigma is known to us. Um, but our algorithmic results extend uh, even without these assumptions. So this problem has been widely studied. And there are many well-known polynomial time algorithms when the covariance matrix sigma is either the identity or is more generally well-conditioned in some sense. These algorithms include uh, the lasso basis pursuit, the Danzig selector, and orthogonal matching pursuit. The first three are convex programs where we're trying to minimize some sort of L1 norm. And the fourth one, orthogonal matching pursuit, is a greedy algorithm that iteratively selects new important variables. And we're going to focus in this talk on the convex programming side of things, specifically on basis pursuit, where we're minimizing the L1 norm subject to the linear constraint imposed by the data. The typical guarantee that we achieve for basis pursuit, or for any of these algorithms, is something like this. If the condition number of sigma is bounded, then we can recover k-sparse vectors with high probability from k log n samples. And the sample complexity scales in the condition number. Um, there are some results that improve upon this and provide weaker bounds than the condition number, uh, but they're all of this flavor. So this leads to a statistical versus computational trade-off, at least a conjecture trade-off. Because information theoretically, for any non-singular covariance matrix sigma, we can actually recover W star exactly with high probability with only k log n samples, even if it's arbitrarily ill-conditioned. And the algorithm is L0 minimization. So we minimize the number of non-zero entries in W subject to the linear constraints. The problem with this algorithm is that it's a non-convex program. And the only way we know how to implement it takes time n to the k. Essentially, we're iterating over all uh, supports of size k. So um, here, k is considered to be slightly bigger than a constant. This is not polynomial time. If we restrict to polytime algorithms, then we do not know how to avoid condition number restrictions until we have n samples. And when we have n samples, then we can just do Gaussian elimination. We don't even need to care about the sparsity of the thing. So there's a essentially exponential uh, gap in sample complexity between what we can do information theoretically and what we can do efficiently when the sigma is ill conditioned. So we might ask, do we have any evidence for this, this conjectured trade-off? And indeed, in the fixed design setting, which is when the covariates can be worst case arbitrary rather than chosen from a distribution, then it's known that sparse linear regression is computationally hard. But in our setting, the random design setting, the lower bounds we know are just against lasso or basis pursuit or related classes of algorithms. So the lower bound is just saying that here's some example that makes this particular algorithm fail. And to add on to this, none of these examples seem computationally hard. They just are hard for specific algorithms. In fact, many of these examples can be successfully solved by one of the classical algorithms, one of the classical polytime algorithms, after a simple change of basis. So this state of affairs uh, motivates us to ask two questions. On the one hand, we'd like to know if there are harder examples for sparse regression that could either motivate computational hardness or that could lead to better algorithms. Specifically, we'll be interested in examples which probably cannot be solved by a change of basis. Uh, the other question is, are there better algorithms for sparse linear regression? Specifically, we like algorithms which can succeed somewhere that the known algorithms don't, 
um, such as unrich classes of ill-conditioned covariate distributions. And in this talk, we'll provide some partial answers to those questions. To give a brief outline, I'll start by presenting a simple ill-conditioned uh, covariant, covariant distribution, which is the random walk. Um, I'll show that even though classical methods fail on this, there is a, a technique which does work, which we call sparse preconditioning. This solves sparse theory regression on the random walk. And this leads into our more general result, which is that we can solve sparse theory regression uh, by a preconditioning approach whenever the covariates have a low tree width dependency graph. And I'll explain that terminology later. Uh, on the other hand, preconditioning is not all powerful. And I'll talk about how we get some hard examples which cannot be solved even by an optimal preconditioner. In particular, I'll show that any high tree width dependency graph emits a hard example. Again, I'll explain that in more detail later. But to start, we'll talk about the random walk. So if we draw n independent um, standard normal random variables, the z1 through zn, then the random walk is defined as the prefix sums, ri is equal to uh, z1 all the way to zi added together. And this is a natural covariance matrix we might encounter in practice um, if the uh, if the covariates represent um, measurements of some process over time. Because in that case, we might expect that the measurement at some time t is closely related to the measurement at time t minus 1. And that indeed is the case for the random walk, where neighboring measurements are highly correlated. Unfortunately, because of this correlation, the covariance matrix that we get, sigma r w, is badly ill-conditioned. So the algorithm guarantees for standard algorithms, such as uh, basis pursuit, no longer apply if we try to do sparse linear regression on this sort of uh, covariate distribution. In fact, basis pursuit also fails in practice. It's not just a limitation of what we've been able to prove. So here, the blue line plots the error of basis pursuit as we increase the number of samples um, for a simple random walk example where we're trying to recover a tooth part signal. And the red line is a slight variant of basis pursuit where we normalize the variances of the covariates to be one. And we can see that neither of these perform very well. They all require um, more than 400 samples. However, this problem is not computationally hard. Um, as the gray line illustrates, we can actually solve this problem uh, much better which, with much lower sample complexity by a preconditioning approach. So what is preconditioning? Obviously, this is not a new technique. It's a very well-studied algorithmic technique for solving linear systems um, more efficiently. But it's less often applied to statistical problems. And here, we're going to be using it to solve sparse linear regression with lower sample complexity. So there's a few different definitions of preconditioning. And this is the one we're going to use. For some rectangular matrix S, or possibly square, uh, but it doesn't have to be. We define the S precondition basis pursuit as the minimizer of the L1 norm of S transpose W subject to the constraints induced by the data. And we can see that if S is the identity, then this just reduces to the uh, vanilla basis pursuit, but in general, it could give different answers. Uh, why is this preconditioning? Because um, when S is invertible, this corresponds to basis pursuit after a simple change of variables. Um, the covariates x map to x times s transpose inverse, and the unknown parameter w star maps to s transpose w star. So taking a look at this transformation, if we want the vanilla basis pursuit to succeed on the um, covariate and parameter after the change of basis, there's a few things that we would like, like to happen. We'd like that the covariates are now well conditioned, and we'd also like that the new parameter vector s transpose w star is still sparse. So the general idea of our algorithms is that we can solve sparse linear regression, even if sigma is ill-conditioned, as long as it has a sparse preconditioner, meaning that sigma can be approximated by SS transpose in a spectral sense, where S is some row sparse matrix. And row sparsity is the property that means that the sparsity of W star is preserved when you apply S transpose. So let's go back to the random walk. To reiterate, our goal is to start with the random walk covariates and change basis to some orthogonal random variable such that each of the random walk variables, each of the original variables, is a sparse combination of the new variables. And naively, if we want to orthogonalize, what we're going to do is take consecutive differences. Um, so essentially, we're orthogonalizing with respect to x1, and then x2, and then x3, and so on. Um, and this is orthogonal. Uh, the consecutive differences are orthogonal just by how we define the random walk. Unfortunately, this uh, does not satisfy the sparsity property. 
because to reconstruct Xn or Rn, um, we need to add up all of the consecutive differences back together. So that's sparsity n. A better approach is to orthogonalize out to the middle vertex of the path, because after we do that, um, the left and right halves of the random walk are now conditionally independent. So if we can independently orthogonalize these two halves, then we've orthogonalized the whole, the whole uh, random walk. So we orthogonalize the middle vertex, and we recurse on the left and right halves. Um, this produces a recursion tree of dot log n and an orthogonal basis. And we can reconstruct any of the original random variables from only log n of the new random variables. Basically, every of the uh, old random variables corresponds to some node on the path, or on the recursion tree. And we can reconstruct it by like tracing back up the tree. And this change of basis is uh, basically the same as the higher way, but change of basis. But what it means is that if we start with covariates from the random walk, then we can precondition them so that they are now isotropically distributed into the covariances of identity. And we only blow up the sparsity of the unknown vector by a factor of log n. So together with standard basis pursuit guarantees when sigma is the identity, we've just shown that we can solve sparsity regression when the covariates are drawn from the random walk in polynomial time with k log squared n samples, because the sparsity is k log n. Um, and the algorithm is this preconditioned basis pursuit. First, we do the preconditioning, and then we apply standard basis pursuit. So that's nice. And it actually generalizes beyond the random walk. To explain how it generalizes, I need to define dependency graphs. So for a covariate distribution x1 through xn, a graph g on these variables is a dependency graph if the Markov property is satisfied, which means that for any two non-adjacent random variables, they are independent conditioned on the neighbors of one of them, or more generally, they're independent conditioned on any separating uh, vertex separating set. As an example, the dependency graph of the random walk is just a path. More generally, for any multivariate Gaussian distribution, we can read off the dependency graph from the non-zero pattern of the precision matrix, namely the inverse covariance matrix. And for Gaussian distributions and beyond, um, the notion of a dependency graph is pretty uh, widely studied. Um, so distributions where we constrain the dependency graph in some way are usually known as graphical models. And there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a whole field that studies graphical models and learning graphical models. For our purposes, we need to assume that the dependency graph of the covariate matrix has tree width at most t. Uh, I'm not going to define tree width, but the salient property of tree width is that this means that the graph has the dependency graph has a balanced separator of size order t. So there's some there's some partition of the variables into sets p, a, and q, where a is small in size order t, p and q are size at most two n over three, and there's no edges between p and q, as we see in this figure. And it's also known that there are efficient algorithms defined to approximately optimal balanced separators. So we'll use that to define a preconditioning algorithm. Uh, first, we find a balanced separator. Then we orthogonalize the whole model with respect to uh, that separator, xA. Uh, now, by the separation property, we know that the two other parts, xP and xQ, are conditionally independent. So we can independently orthogonalize those two uh, sets of variables. We recurs on xP, we recurs on xQ. And just like for the random walk, this recursion tree has depth order log n uh, because of the balance property of the separator. And similarly to the random walk, at each node of the recursion tree, we're only uh, orthogonalizing with respect to t random variables or order t random variables um, because the separators are small. So we can reconstruct any of the original random variables by tracing up this recursion tree. Uh, so we get a t log n sparse combination of the new orthogonalized random variables. Um, and this uh, this sort of recursive technique based on tree width is closely related to the nested dissection technique for solving linear systems. But here we have a different application. So like before, our preconditioning algorithm, together with a way of finding the balance separators, together with classical lasso guarantees or basis pursuit guarantees uh, for um, isotropic covariates, give us our main algorithmic result, which is that sparse linear regression with covariates and zero sigma can be solved in polytime with kt log squared n samples 
if the dependency graph of sigma has tree width most t. And I'll note that although we only talked about the noiseless setting, this algorithm still works in the noisy setting. Um, moreover, we don't even need to know uh, sigma, the covariance matrix, as long as we know the dependency graph. We can run a similar algorithm that approximately orthogonalizes using the empirical covariance instead of the true covariance. Now we turn to lower bounds. So we've shown that a low tree width dependency graph enables efficient recovery with no condition number assumptions on the covariance matrix. Um, and we might ask, what about other dependency structures? For example, if all we know is that the dependency graph is sparse, which is another common assumption, um, then can we still precondition? And one example of a sparse graph with high tree width is the square grid or various variants of it, such as this one here. Unfortunately, what we show is that this is not possible, at least for preconditioning algorithms. So we show that for any tree with T dependency graph G, there are covariates with this dependency graph, such that we need poly T samples to solve sparse linear regression, even if the signal is log N sparse, um, for an optimally preconditioned basis proceed. So any preconditioner has or needs the sample complexity. To sketch the proof, we're going to use the polynomial grid minor theorem, which says that any graph with true with t has a poly t size square grid minor. And what this lets us do is it lets us reduce proving the theorem to constructing a hard example uh, where the dependency graph is the square grid. Now, there's a lot of work in the literature on conditions that make basis pursuit or lasso succeed on sufficient conditions for it to succeed but there's much less work on simple sufficient conditions for it to fail. So that's another key piece of our proof. We show that for a specific preconditioner, basis pursuit fails if either the preconditioner is dense in some appropriate sense, or it has a large weak compatibility constant. So we can think of this as essentially a converse to the compatibility constant, which is well known in the last literature. The compatibility constant is a condition under which if it's small, then basis pursuit succeeds. The weak compatibility constant, we prove that if it's large, then basis pursuit fails. So that is a, a good condition um, for a single preconditioner. But we want to show that basis pursuit failed for any preconditioner. This is a lot harder. What we show is that the covariates do not admit any preconditioner if sigma is both ill-conditioned and also the top eigenspace in some sense, consists entirely of dense vectors. And roughly the reasoning for why this causes um, no preconditioner to exist is that either the preconditioner would have to, like if it fixes the O conditioning issue, then it would have to be dense by the second property. And conversely, if it's sparse, then it would not be able to fix the O conditioning. So what we've reduced to is trying to find a covariance matrix that's O conditioned has its property uh, of density. And also, it needs to have a dependency graph that's supported on the grid graph. And that means that the precision matrix, the inverse covariance, um, needs to have a non-zero pattern that's supported on the grid graph. And we achieve this by a gadget construction, uh, which is sketched here for color. To conclude, I'll mention some open questions. So on the algorithmic side of things, um, we might ask if there are any high tree width dependency graphs which can be efficiently solved without condition number assumptions. And one good example is the grid graph, which we've shown that precondition algorithms do not, are not able to solve, but maybe there are new algorithmic techniques that would work. Uh, second, we've only talked about preconditioned basis pursuit. We might also ask what's the proper, the power of preconditioned greedy methods for the orthogonal matching pursuit. On the hardness front, um, we might ask if there are hardness against broader families of algorithms um, or restricted computational models, or even a reduction in based hardness based on um, conjectured hardness of some problems such as planted quick. And with that, thank you for listening.